Good evening. I'd like to ask those of you who are able to hold your thumbs out. If you put your hands together, the width of your thumbs is approximately the area that our eyes hold in focus every day. The rest of this auditorium is out of focus, and we don't even notice it because our minds fill in those areas. We also have blind spots in our eyes. All mammals do. It's where the optic nerve sends all the messages to our brain. That part has no way to actually see things. So why is seeing important? We live in a time when corporations, businesses, government entities, politicians, news organizations would like to frame the news. They'd like to tell us how to think and what to see when we have information in front of us. Photojournalism and photography, in my opinion, allows us to take a moment and hold it and freeze it out of time. We can return back to that image and get a sense of what we experienced. We can go somewhere where we might not have had the chance to go. We can also look at an image after we've learned more about ourselves or learned more about the world. We might find little clues in the image. If we look at this one in particular, we can see a gymnastics ring. We can see a pier off in the distance. And for those of you who may have gone to California or lived in California, you'd say, that's the Santa Monica Pier. Good photos ask more questions than provide answers. And thank you for chuckling, <laughs> and please feel free to do so when appropriate. Photographers also like to play with perspective. We'd like to move your eye around the image. We'd like to show depth. We'd like to give you the experience of being there. Another thing I look for are moments that we might all share or hold in common, or we might remember back into our childhood of doing the same thing. We can experience emotions. One of the things I like to do, especially when I'm covering an event, is move to the edges. Step away from what's on stage because that's what people are organizing or that's what folks want us to pay attention to. But more often than not, the things on the side, the things out of view, the things that are happening on the periphery are far more interesting for me. This was an assignment I had where a professor asked us to photograph someone we knew and someone we didn't know. And for those of you wondering, this is the person I did not know. I walked up to her in the bookstore and I said, you have a very interesting face. I have this assignment and I'd like to make your portrait. And she responded that I'd like to paint myself with temper paint. It might be fun to document. I can report to you today that we are still friends. <laughs> Some images speak for themselves. One of my professors from Brazil was talking about film. And when I started in school, we actually had polyester and then different layers of gelatin that were photosensitive. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the film was designed specifically to reproduce Anglo skin. So the film itself had racism built into it. If you wanted to reproduce African-American skin or Asian skin or folks of any particular color, you had to use special techniques, both in the darkroom and even with the capture itself in the camera. I was at a championship baseball game and I saw one of the players kiss the bat of her teammate for good luck. So the next time I figured out she was coming up to bat, I moved over to the right area and got ready, and I was too high. Fortunately, the game went to extra innings, and I was able to get down low enough that I could get the moment when she kissed the bat through the chain. This was the 18th and last time that I photographed this team doing this. 
Photos can often and also send messages that might be mixed or that might contradict each other. We might experience joy, sadness, strength, weakness. We may even see hope in this image. One day I was at my favorite pizza shop and I saw this couple. They had just been married by the justice of the peace. They walked down to the square and this was their first meal as husband and wife. I took some images, I got their name, and then I went back to the newspaper and my boss and I couldn't figure out which image to use. Do we use the one on the left, which is sort of introspective and anticipatory, or the one where they're sharing and smiling and enjoying each other? Which image you run and how you write the caption can alter how we look at an image. I met this gentleman one time at a Memorial Day parade. I crossed the street to get his name and I found out this is the first time he was in uniform back in the States after returning from Vietnam. I ran into him a year later and this time the sunlight was falling on him but the rest of the people at the ceremony were in shadow. They became metaphorically representative of the fallen. I had the good fortune to work on the Navajo Nation. I had to learn about new symbols, a new culture. I had to learn what was important. And for those of us, if you go to a wrestling match, what is the hero going to look like on the Navajo Nation? I suspect someone like him. This is an Afghani interpreter and an American soldier saying prayers together on the top of a mountain in the midst of a combat tour. They both protected my life using different tools. One day we got an assignment, or I got an assignment, that asked me to go and meet this group. Uh, NFL player had donated some of his money from his sponsor to give them uniforms. And when I met the team and I met the coaches, I began to realize that the story was much deeper than that. That yes, they were playing basketball, but the coaches knew that many of them, if any of them, would ever play in college, yet alone make it to the pros. So what their focus was on is building men, teaching these young men responsibility, how to play as a team, how to be a leader. The goal was to help keep them out of gangs. The goal was for them to graduate high school. The goal was for them to go to college. At their last tournament of the season, after the games were all over, they went to the beach. And for many of them, this is the first time that they had ever seen the ocean. Can you imagine what it was like to dip your toe into the water for the first time? Can you remember that experience? Can you imagine what that was like? I also had the good fortune to photograph one, if not the last, bookmobile ladies in Kentucky. The story as presented to me was, here's this woman who plays a guitar and drives a bookmobile. But what I started to learn was that she was a lifeline. She visited with people. She went to their homes, she went to their communities. She helped spark the imagination of the young people. And I love this young woman just holding on to her book. How many of us have hugged their books? She was also very rooted in the community and on the ground and the land. She raced horses long distance, And ironically, or perhaps intentionally, or on purpose, the first bookmobile ladies actually rode mules across Kentucky. So there was a historical connection. What I was running into the problem was that she also had a very deep faith. And I wasn't sure how to make that image. 
And I also knew I had to finish my assignment on Friday, so I would not be able to go to church with her. And so the last day, we went out, I should say we, she went out for a walk. She goes out for a walk every morning, and I tagged along with her, but I never spoke to her. I let her do what she would normally do. And this is the image that I was hoping that I might find at the end of the day. Why don't we see more images like this of the homeless? Why do we not see or hear stories of their affection, of their relationships? The reasons why they don't go to a shelter because they would have to be split apart. This couple's married. Both of them have jobs. But they choose to live here rather than live apart. A little closer to home, many of us, I'm sure, walk by this building regularly, if not daily. But how many of us have noticed that small bullet hole left on the lintel of the Lyceum? A relic of the integration of our university. And yet, when they renovated the building, they left it there. A physical manifestation of the scars that we still carry as an institution to this day. Probably recognize this building as well. It's quite glorious in the afternoon sunlight. But unless we've taken the history department's tour, we might walk right by those fingerprints. And yet, when my five-year-old son puts them there, we know approximately the age of the enslaved child who helped make those bricks. Who would shoot a road sign? Who would shoot a marker, especially when the first word is freed? What message are they trying to send? There are members of our community who are intentionally working so that we do not forget our past, so that we understand it, and so that we're able to face it. They gathered recently up in Abbeville to collect soil from the scene where an African-American man was lynched. What does conciliation look like? Let's maybe take a little experiment here. This was about a year, year and a half ago has anything or anything much changed in our community since these people marched down the street? I spoke with the man on the right in this photo for about an hour. He was a Vietnam vet who was very concerned that if this statue was taken down or relocated, we might someday do the same thing with a memorial for Vietnam. And I told him that if anyone ever suggested that, I would be standing right next to him. The interesting thing was in the course of our conversation, he was also able and willing to hear my concerns. And he was certainly open to there being a memorial or recognition for the folks who've been lynched in our community. And I'm pleased to report that that plaque has gone up on the east side of the courthouse square. Do we need this many officers to protect a statue? Why is this man able to show this level of emotion? And why do our students respond like this? Why, 50 years after these signs were carried in Memphis, do men still feel the need to carry them again? And if you don't have someone next to you who can whisper the answer, I will happily give it to you out in the lobby after our conversation tonight. What do you see here? I see a sister and a brother. I see a family. I 
I see a dreamer. I see a young man who plays with children who look just like his sister. The photographer Jay Mizell once said that if you see the world from even one or two degrees difference, it's an entirely new world. And I have to tell you, report back to you, that he's absolutely right. So I would encourage you to have the strength and the courage to have conversation with people that you might initially disagree with, to try to find new perspectives, to step out of your comfort zone, and to maybe see the world just a little bit differently. And I hope tonight gives you the tools that you can go out and do that. Thank you.